the clock's gilded hand jerked forward. Another minute gone, another thirty, and the bell would ring for end of market. Eleven o'clock and home for dinner. The crowds were thinning. Most people shopped early in the day in the cool of early morning. Other stalls were closing up, packing away their goods. He dared not follow suit. His father was strict and every penny counted. Dare not miss a sale. But under the counter, propped open, Ovid took him far from Stratford's Thursday market, took him as he strode the leather binding back to Lancashire and earnings to buy books. Then, as he sank into the words, into the world he wanted to be his. But into that world came duty, trade, a woman saying, and in fact selling gloves. He looked up, the vendor's patter ready on his tongue, saw great eyes, dark hair under a straw hat, an amused smile, a familiar face, Anne, Mistress Hathaway, I wondered if you would remember me, of course, why should I not, I've not been away that long, Two years. I had heard you were back. You should have come to call on us. My father keeps me busy, as you see. Yet somehow I'm forced my way through the eager crowds. You're right. Trade is poor today. But just the same. Well, cheer up. It's about to amend a little. For although I'm glad to see you again, I really do need to buy gloves. Mistress, you shall have gloves. The finest in all England. The finest in the known world. Chevrolet, deer skin, pig skin. Your size, madam, and the colour you prefer. For every day or something finer. Brisk and business like, that's the way. The finest in Stratford will do. I don't know what my size, and I want the gloves for best. When did you return? Last week. And bored already? And bored already. Give me your hand. She had already taken off her own gloves. He took her hand, stroking her finger straight, the finger 
and thumb of his right hand encircling her wrist. When they were children, he had often clasped her hand to gain her attention for his chatter or to keep up with her as they walked. Now this was a different touch. She was a farmer's daughter, a country woman, but hers was no housewife's hand, red and scarred and rough from work. Of course, the Hathaways were well to do. Their daughters didn't labour in the fields and Anne could afford the rose water he smelled on her skin. He liked the trusting way her small sun browned hand lay in his. She was looking at him oddly. The beginning of a frown pulled her dark brows together. Quickly he smoothed a glove into her hand. See how sweetly it fits, how smoothly, how fittingly, that made him laugh. You are very poetic for a lover, but lover is very close to lover. And must a lover not be poetic, mistress? You may well be a lover, sir, but to me you are a lover. I would be both, lady. Maybe, but I am in the market for gloves, not love. Give me first refusal when you do shop for love, mistress. But I do not look to purchase love. Nay, give it freely. So, if love is close to love, you must give me the gloves freely which is just as well, for I do not require crimson gloves, nor can I afford them. But the crimson becomes you with your hair, your eyes, yes, crimson. Try the other glove if you would not try, my love. Resistless, laughing, she tried the other glove. Chevrolet was the most expensive leather and crimson gloves. Your father knows his business when he leaves you in charge. I will take them, but I must have some plainer ones as well. Yes, those. Will you have them sent? May I bear them like a gift to you? No. I will bear them, or at least I'll wear them, best wrapped up in the crimson, best wrap up the crimson ones, as he did so, she thrust them deep into her basket, she said, 
Where is it you've been, William? In the north, wasn't it? Yes, Lancashire. Beautiful. If you like moss. No, it has its own kind of beauty, much wilder than here. Fewer people. At least you've travelled. I've been no more than five miles from Stratford all my life. And would you like to? Very much. Doubt I ever will. Ordinary women like me don't. I would like to see London. Tell you a secret, and it really is a secret. I was supposed to come straight home from Lancashire, but I told some lies. Fudge the time I was to leave, and went to London. I had a whole week there. Oh, she sighed, and is it marvellous, beautiful, full of marvels, and beautiful in lots of ways, also crowded, dirty, noisy, and I loved it, as if by way of punctuation. The bell rang for the close of market, and prompt as conscience came the voice of Anne's stepmother at her shoulder. So there you are. I've been looking everywhere for you. We'll be late home. Have you brought the look? the cascara for Tom's constipation. Yes, mother. And the flannel. Yes, mother. Then come along. I must pay for my gloves. I'll catch you up. Putting the money on the counter, she said quickly, softly, to William. Will you come to visit us? You're always welcome. Please do. I would like that. I haven't forgotten the way. Good. Mrs. Hathaway was waiting, staring back at her. I must go. Yes, goodbye. They were barely out of earshot when Anne's stepmother said, You'll get yourself a name as a trollop, flirting and giggling with shopkeepers' apprentices like that. I wasn't flirting, I was buying gloves. Though I may have laughed once or twice, and he's no apprentice, he's Mr. Shakespeare's oldest son. Oh, you could tell Joan Hathaway's mood by the way she walked. Now she twitched her bum like a cross cat. And of course, you and the Shakespeare's are on such close terms. Father was friendly with Mr. Shakespeare, as you know. He came to Father's funeral. 
but wouldn't stay for so much as the usual drink. Anne said nothing. The fact was that in marrying Anne's father, Joan Hathaway had risen a little above her station in life. Her father had been a hired man on one of the Earl of Warwick's estates, so a prosperous widower of some standing, whose family had for many years farmed ninety leaf-sold acres, was quite a catch for her. Of course their own people were respectable, but they had no position, no roots going generations deep into the life and management of Warwickshire's community. These things counted in the country and people like the Shakespeare's, the mercantile class that ran the towns and inherited their land, were courteous to her as Mrs. Richard Hathaway, but no more. Even after thirteen years, she didn't quite speak the language as it were. She didn't know her way through the web of relationships and feuds and alliances. Anne's own mother had called Mrs. Shakespeare Mary and talked of childhood days at Wilmcote and traced connections through third cousins who had married second cousins-in-laws. Joan Hathaway cursed when they met and called her Mrs. Shakespeare. After a few more steps, not that the Shakespeare are, the Shakespeare's are so grand these days. Twitch, twitch. They say he's losing money hand over fist. Still, large family, isn't it? Five children. How old? William will be 18 now. Gilbert, 16 or so. Joan's about 13. Richard's a few years younger. Then there is the little boy, Edmund. He's two. Well used to her stepmother's mental processes such as they were, and knew she was matching these ages with those of her own four children. John Shakespeare might be having money troubles now, but things could change and he had been an alderman and bailiff of Stratford. He owned that big house on Henley Street, besides other land. He had a finger in many pies, and his wife had been an ardent a Shakespeare son of ten, a Hathaway daughter of eight. Come to that, a Shakespeare son of two, a 
Hathaway, daughter of six. It was never too soon to plan. Didn't they have to send that William boy away? Someone found him work in the country, tutoring a gentleman's sons. Hmm, well if he's only eighteen, there's no youth still flirting with him, not at your age. And I think I'll stop there.